Hey guys, now that you had a chance to take a break, we're going to pick up with spine motion restriction. Um, so up until 2013, uh, immobilization was the standard of care. If you had were involved in any kind of significant MOI where spinal injury was uh, need was uh, predicted or possible, you got put on the board. And it's estimated that up to five million patients a year with no evidence of spinal injury, if they were, they were just going based off the mechanism of injury, received spinal immobilization. The backboard also became a popular and very convenient device to move patients regardless of suspect of spinal injury. And the thing is, they would move them to the stretcher, but they would leave them on the board and transport them on that board instead of taking them back off. Now, it's impossible to achieve complete spinal immobilization. The American College of Emergency Physicians recommends a spinal motion restriction over immobilization attempts. Spinal motion restriction aims to maintain anatomic alignment of the spine and to keep gross movement to a minimum. Specific adjuncts are not mandated for spinal motion restriction. The indications for which patients should receive spinal motion restriction are based on a variety of sources. It is important to follow your local protocol which might include many of those described in this section, such as they have to have a GCS score of a 15, do not have a suspected head injury, they are not intoxicated or under the influence of any drugs, do not have a distracting injury such as a long bone fracture, laceration, or other injury that would cause more pain than the vertebral column if it's injured, and they can communicate effectively to understand your questions and provide appropriate responses. Where they do not, and by that, by communication barriers, this would be like such as hearing loss, deafness, or a language barrier. Other SMR or spine motion restriction criteria may be required by your local protocol. Some protocols can include motor vehicle crashes with high energy collision, rollovers, ejection and pedestrian vehicle collision. If they are unreliable, have any neurological deficit, well you want to go ahead and take spinal motion restriction protocols. Patients with penetrating injuries to the head, neck, or torso who do not have a, any neurologic deficits or indication of spinal injury should not receive spinal SMR utilizing a backboard due to potentially causing further extenuation of their injuries. If they're able to communicate with you, have no distracting injuries, no neurological uh, deficits, and no spinal pain or tenderness, you may not necessarily have to apply spine motion restriction. Now, SMR techniques vary widely depending on your protocol. Um, and they might include any of the following, such as application of a soft C collar uh, and securing, securing of the patient to the stretcher, uh, maybe using a rigid C collar, um, placing them in a C collar and putting them on a vacuum mattress and then placing them on the stretcher, uh, you know, putting them on a C collar, lifting them to the stretcher using a scoop scratcher, and then once they move into the stretcher, then remove them from the scoop. Um, you know, we may even place the seat collar, place them on a board, move them to the stretcher, and then remove them from the board. We may use a KED to move them up onto the board. Um, and then place them on the, from the KED to the board and then to the stretcher. Or go full SMR where we place them on the stretcher, or excuse me, on the spine board secure them to the backboard and secure the head using a, a CID and secure the head to the stretcher as well. C collars, um, these are not designed to completely immobilize the head. They are meant to help remind the person not to move their head. The issue with C collars, uh, it can cause an increase in intracranial pressure um, due to the increase in anxiety and also placing pressure on the carotid arteries. 
If there, it can also cause an increase in pressure source if it is placed on too big. When sizing it, you want to use your fingers to measure the distance from the shoulder of the patient to their chin. If not fitted properly, it may allow greater movement of the patient's head or neck. Take that distance between the sizing post, which is the black fastener, which you right around here, and the lower edge of the plastic should match that of the number of fingers stacked previously measured against the neck. And then once you get it properly sized, assemble, form the collar, and place it on the patient. Historically, the standard device used to restrict movement of the entire spinal column was a long uh, rigid backboard. Although backboards can have many harmful effects, some EMS systems continue to allow their use as part of the SMR protocol. The hazards and harmful effects of securing and transporting a patient on a long board. Um, if they are placed on the board, they are now unable to maintain their own airway and are prone to aspiration of gastric contents if they vomit. The straps that are tightened across the patient's chest have a restricted effect on breathing by interfering with its mechanics. The board can cause pain in patients who had no pain before being secured. If they did have pain, it could have been worsened by the board. And then because boards are commonly stored in outside compartments, um, for systems that operate in cold uh, or cool environments, the board is often the same temperature as the ambient air outside or in the station bay, which can cause the patient uh, to possibly have a hypothermic uh, condition. Pressure sores um, are also possible, and those that are placed supine in the back of the ambulance on a spine board are more likely to experience motion sickness as in a moving ambulance. Current research has also shown that more manipulation can occur when applying and using these devices as compared to having patients simply extricate themselves uh, from the vehicle while maintaining their own self-restriction of the head and neck. The EMS crew can instead remove the patient using a rapid extrication technique. Straps or cravats are placed to keep the patient from sliding up and down or laterally on the board. Deceleration straps are, normally, are another important adjunct to securing the patient. These straps are fastened across the patient's shoulders. Some other tools for SMR would be your short extrication device, such as the KED. However, they are rarely used. But However, um, they are still carried in our area. So we want to make sure that you are still familiar with them. The reason they're rarely used is because of the amount of time that it takes to place them on. Um, some other equipment that you might come into contact with or that you will come into contact with is your CIDs or your head stabilization device. Make, you want to make sure that you are familiar with use, the use of them as well. If the patient is able to ambulate on their own where they are reliable and no indications of injury is seen, uh, you want to instruct the patient to hold his or her neck and head and neck in a neutral inline position and not to move it. When approaching the patient, do so from directly in front of them so that way they remain focused forward and do not move their head and neck to the side to look at you. Immediately instruct the patient as you approach them to bring their head and neck in an inline position by lining up their nose with their umbilicus or their belly button and not to bend, rotate, extend, or flex their head or neck. They should bring their head and feet, or excuse me, bring their feet and toes together and in line with their nose as well. Assess your patient for any pain or tenderness and ask if they have any pain anywhere, especially in their neck or along the vertebral column. Palpate the posterior vertebral column gently and determine if the patient has any tenderness. Assess PMS in the upper extremities. Have the patient maintain self-restriction and continue to look forward uh, with their arms at their sides. And then once you get done with your upper extremities, you will then want to assess PMS in the lower extremities. 
Once that's been done, the patient should be instructed to relax and allowed to freely move if they meet the following criteria. Patient, reliable patient, able to communicate, no intoxication, no pain, tenderness, or abnormality, and no PMS deficits. If that has been done, the spine has now been cleared, and there is no need for any further spine motion restriction procedures. If the patient is to be transported, they could be placed uh, directly on the stretcher mattress in a comfortable position. Whoopsie. If you are having to provide um, spinal motion restriction for an ambulatory patient, keep him in. You're going to apply your C collar, bring the stretcher directly behind them, have them sit back on it, have the patient lift their legs up onto the stretcher. Have them lie back and secure them to the stretcher in a supine position. If having to place them uh, on a board, first ensure that uh, before you do anything, you want to make sure that all life threatening situations have been managed. Um, then you're going to check PMS, apply your C collar, log roll the patient up onto the on the other side, position the board behind them. Uh, roll them, log roll them back on, down onto the board, position the patient on the board, and then secure the patient too. If you are only using it as a movement device only, you're going to use the same premise, but we're not applying a C collar unless the, that is needed. Uh, once you secure them to the board, you're going to move the patient to the stretcher, place the backboard onto their toes, um, instruct them to keep their uh, toes, nose, and umbilicus lined up, and you're going to move them onto the board, or excuse me, move them from the board to the stretcher. If they are, if you're having to, if they are taking spinal motion restriction and extricating themselves from the vehicle, you're going to instruct the patient to maintain constant self-restriction and rotate 180 degrees until his back faces the stretcher. Have the second EMT, who should now be positioned on the opposite side of the stretcher as the patient, prevent the stretcher from moving and guide the patient back onto the stretcher mattress. When placing the KED, same premise, you're going to assess the back, scapula, arms, or clavicles before you apply the board. Um, make sure that no life threats are noted. Um, place the, the KED behind the patient. Uh, tighten the torso and leg straps first. Then secure the head um, and then the chest. Never pat between the C-collar and the board either. If you're having to provide rapid extrication um, where you don't have time to get the patient out, such as the scene being unsafe, unstable patient, or if they're having to get, you're needing to get to a second more seriously injured patient. To do this, you're going to quickly uh, apply a C collar, do a rapid physical and primary assessment. Place the backboard behind the patient while supporting the thorax. We're going to rotate until her back is facing the open car door and bring the patient's legs and feet up onto the car seat. You're going to stabilize the cot under the board and begin to lower the patient onto the board and then slide her up. If time permitting, and the patient's condition permits, we can uh, consider removing the roof before performing a rapid extrication to give everybody more room to work. Um, however, same premise though to remove the patient out. 
With helmets, thorough assessment of a patient can be difficult under any circumstance. And the presence of this helmet makes it even more difficult. But the removal of a helmet should not be an automatic step uh, just because such removal could risk aggravating a spinal injury if one exists. We want to make sure that the patient is fully alert, make sure that it fits, make sure that it's not moving around, and make sure that we can still assess the patient's airway and breathing, um, and make sure that we can access it if it goes downhill. If the helmet fits well, no impending problems, um, and helmet removal would cause potential further injury, leave it on. Leave the helmet on. You can provide uh, SMR with the helmet on. So if you have the head blocks like what we use in class, that's why one side is flat and the other side is angled. Now, if we remove it, if we are unable to assess or reassess the airway and breathing, it doesn't fit well, um, they're in cardiac arrest, or we're unable to adequately manage the airway. Now, there are two types of helmets that we will see, and the way that we remove the helmets varies. We have our sports helmets and we have our motorcycle helmets. Um, now, the face masks on football helmets, they can be removed. Uh, they either have a plastic clip that can be easily pulled off, or they may have screws that the athletic and the athletic trainer will have the the use the tools to remove those screws. Um, motorcycle helmets these generally cover the full face, so these will this will prevent access to the patient's airway if it is a full a full helmet. To remove a helmet, you have one rescuer um, at the head. Make sure that if the patient has any eyeglasses on, you remove them before you attempt to remove the helmet. One rescuer is stabilizing the helmet by placing hands on each side of the helmet with fingers on the mandible or lower jaw to prevent movement. Second rescuer will loosen the chin strap and place one hand anteriorly on the mandible at the angle of the jaw and the other hand at the back of the head. The rescuer holding the helmet should pull the sides of the helmet apart. This way we can gently slip the helmet um, off the patient's head. We'll slide it halfway up and then stop. As we continue to go through the removal process, uh, the second rescuer continues sliding their hand under the patient's helmet to maintain uh, stabilization. Once the helmet has been completely removed, the, top, the rescuer at the top replaces their hands on either side of the patient's head with palms over the ears taking over stabilization and then we continue on with spinal motion restriction. Recommendations now state that when appropriate Helmets and shoulder pads should be removed before transport of an athlete with a suspected cervical spinal injury. This rationale for equipment removal is due to advances in sporting equipment technology and removing this equipment expedites the athlete's care. Another reason why this equipment should be removed before transport is that the athletic trainer and EMT often have more experience with equipment removal than other medical team members or hospital and emergency department staff. When all equipment has been removed, a C-collar should be applied to the patient. Following the application of the C-collar, the athlete should be lifted onto a long backboard, secured, and transported. Car seats that were involved in crashes may have lost the, integ the integrity of the structure and may no longer provide protection for the child if another crash were to occur. If it was involved in a crash, um, we want to transfer the child to a backboard.
step one is you will uh, make sure that your equipment is prepared. So rescuer number two will do that. Um, rescuer number one will stabilize the car seat in upright position while applying manual stabilization. Once uh, EMT number two is prepared, they will then loosen or cut the seat straps and raise the front guard. In children less than eight years of age, if any MOI suggests possible spinal injury, it is prudent to provide SMR appropriate for the young child. <laughs> While EMT number one is still maintaining spinal precautions and st uh, manual stabilization, EMT two will apply their C collar. You want to make sure that this fits properly before applying it to the ch to your patient. Once they are ready, they will work as a team. Placing the safety seat at the center of the backboard and slowly tilting it back into a supine position. They want to be careful not to let the child slide out. For with a child with a large head, make sure that you place a towel under the area where the shoulders will eventually be placed on the board to prevent the head from tilting forward. Um, if you don't have a collar that fits, you can stabilize the neck with a roll towel. Uh, just simply tape the towel to the backboard and manually support the patient's head in a neutral inline position. Once you get it back, you'll, EMT number one will maintain manual stabilization and in a coordinated fashion along the long axis, move the patient up onto the board. Once the board, the patient has been moved up, um, make sure that you keep that, place the towel beneath the shoulders or in between the shoulders. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So that way we can make sure that the airway stays in line. Make sure that you pad appropriately and secure the patient. Do not strap across the abdomen because this can impede their air breathing status. Alright guys, that completes the lecture for this chapter. If you have any questions, please be sure to send them to me either in Remind or in Blackboard. Um, or make sure that you write them down um, and bring them to me in class. Um, make sure that you're working on your Brady Labs. Otherwise, I will see you all next time in class.